Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I'm Amelia. <laughs> yep. I'm Tom. It's Monday with Jesus in and it's date we're in Dayton, Ohio. And the story today is from Gospel of Matthew. It's the last story for the season of Epiphany. Wonderful story. It's pretty yep. cool. called the Transfiguration. So Tom will tell it to us and then we'll talk about it. All right. Well, I love this story. Uh, so here it is. Six days after Jesus' uh, prophecy of his death and resurrection and his words about uh, the disciples needing to take up their cross and follow him, six days later, uh, Jesus took with him uh, Peter and James and his brother John and took them up a high mountain by themselves and uh, and suddenly he was he was transformed he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white and then suddenly there appeared with him Moses and Elijah talking to him. And, and Peter said, Lord, it's good that we're here. Uh, if you'd like, you know, I'll build three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And out of the cloud, a voice. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard the voice from the cloud, they fell on the ground, overwhelmed with fear. But Jesus came over and he, he touched them. And he said, you can get up. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw only Jesus alone. By himself. As they were coming down the mountain, he said to them, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Thank you, Tom. Uh -huh. Now, what a story. Be, be honest here. Do you think this really happened? Well, something happened. Okay. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't know, you know, about uh, Moses and Elijah and uh, the cloud, and, but this is full of allusions to the experience of Moses uh, and Elijah, but especially of Moses. Uh, at Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and and uh, so it's it's a story that renders a dimension of their experience of Jesus that I think they wanted to convey in the telling of this story that nothing else would do in quite the same way uh, and so while I'm uncertain about the historical verifiability of every detail of the story. Uh, I think it does convey in a marvelous way a dimension of the disciples' experience of Jesus and then of what they tried to 
convey in their telling of the story after uh, the Son of Man had been raised. So they did try to tell this story. And uh, and it's it's a marvelous story. Yeah. Yeah, the, you know, people have reported re religious visions, but, you know, a long time, ever since. So yeah. who, who are yeah. we to say? Who are we to say it might not be in one way or another? Yeah. Okay, well, so now you mentioned... We uh, are who we are. Yeah. You mentioned Mount Sinai. This isn't have, taking place in Mount Sinai. What what mountain is it? Prob that this is probably, the, and what Matthew's listeners would have understood, is that it was Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is right near Caesarea Philippi. It uh, overshadows uh, Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was where Jesus uh, said you know, had the Messianic Confession and uh, the discipleship uh, discourse. And so in the aftermath of this prophecy that he would be crucified and killed, uh, humiliated, uh, spit upon, beaten, so on, uh, there is this vision then of his glory. And it's not unlike uh, the hymn in Philippians, uh, you know, captures some of that. Uh, you know, he was, uh, 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 he was humiliated before us, uh, but God, uh, oh, I'm forgetting that, I'm forgetting the hymn. Oh, I'll look that up and find that hymn in Philippians. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it, it does have a lot of the same dynamics as this story, doesn't right. it? Yeah. Right, right. Yep. Or I mean, it's it's it affirms the story in in light of what this follows, which is, as you said, the messianic confession. Right. Right. Yep. So um, so there's this description of Jesus being transfigured, which other than in the story, I'd never heard that word. <laughs> Um, there's some explanation, you know, he had dazzling white clothes on. What? T just talk to us a little bit about that word, please. Well, it's the the Greek word is metamorpho. Metamorphosis is the English word that we have from that. It means a change of form, uh, a change of uh, a, a transformation uh, would be uh, a more uh, literal uh you know, rendering of the Greek word. Uh, but what it meant was that uh, he, they saw him in a whole different light. Uh, and that, uh, but many dimensions of this vision that they had of Jesus are reminiscent of the transfiguration of Moses, who came down from the mountain uh, and his face was shining. And uh, when he would go in to talk with the uh, with the Lord, uh, his he would come out and his face would be shining like the sun. So uh, so it's that same dynamic of being in the presence of God, and then of this being you know, and of being transformed by that. Um, is the presence this vision of Jesus being with Moses and Elijah? Has that have we heard about that before? And what's the significance of that? Other than as you you know, you've been talking about the connections to those stories of Moses. Right. Well, there you know, there have been a uh, a number of allusions in Matthew to Moses, you know, the the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> there are five uh major discourses in Matthew, which is uh clearly an allusion to the five books of the torah uh and so uh, uh there are many allusions to the moses experience that are present in matthew's story uh, and in this case uh it's uh it's full of that that story is in the background and uh and I think Matthew assumes that his listeners will make those connections and will see and hear 
uh, the resonances of the Moses uh, transformation when he received the Ten Commandments and brought them down from the uh, from the mountain. Uh, so, what about Elijah? Well, Elijah too was at the mountain in the cave, and uh, and he experienced God as a, a, a variously a still small voice, uh, a voice of a pure silence. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Elijah also had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. <laughs> hey, um, what else was I going to, oh, uh, so Peter, when Peter sees this, <laughs> Jesus with Moses and Elijah offers to build a dwelling for each of them. At least that's the, what the NRV has it. Right. What, is that, I mean, I'm, in my mind, dwelling would suggest a little house or something. Is that what we're supposed to be thinking, that he wanted a place for them to live? or what's No. Okay. And it's not a good translation. Booths is really better. It doesn't communicate much to, uh, but the Feast of Booths uh, has always been a feast, a festival in which you'd build a dwelling outside, not a dwelling, build a tent uh, outside in the yard and that there be, uh, it was a time of celebration. Uh, so, oh, Tippy wanted to get in the action there. <laughs> uh, so a better translation is a tent and it's an illusion. It's the same word that is that it translates uh, the uh, Hebrew word, uh, which is uh, uh, machane. Yeah. And uh, uh, and the Greek word is skenos. Uh, and they both both of those words refer to a tent. Uh, to the tent of meeting in the case of uh, uh, the stories of Exodus, uh, that uh, Moses would meet God in the tent of meeting. And that's what this is clearly an allusion to. And that's a more temporary story. dwelling a, than we yeah, would imagine. It's, yeah. it's more like a camp. Yeah, It's the, like going camping and <laughs> putting up a tent. Uh and and that's the basic meaning of the word in Hebrew. Mahana is a, a, an encampment. Uh, so dwelling is really not a good word. Here. So you think if somebody, you know, those of, uh, of us who are telling the story would be better to use the word tent? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. It is. It's. It isn't. Doesn't solve all the ambiguities, but it's much more accurate than a dwelling which implies building a house, a little house or something. Okay, so after we um, Peter makes that uh, offer, uh, what made me think, I know this story from Mark, and then Mark, there's this comment about Peter, he didn't know what to say. You know? Yeah. Um, you, we don't have that in Matthew. Um, no, he's not a bumbling yeah. <laughs> fool quite as much as in Mark. Right. Um, but we do have a comment that from the narrator that the disciples were afraid. Why would they have been afraid? It's the same dynamic as was present at the mountain of Mount Sinai when Jesus, when Moses came down with the tablets. Uh, there was uh, at that time when Moses discovered that they had made the golden calf. Uh, he sent the Levites into the people, uh, and, and they killed over 3,000 people, according to the story. Uh, so it was something to be afraid of. It wasn't inappropriate for them to be overwhelmed with fear in the presence of God. And that's the implication, is that they heard the voice, and they heard it as the voice of God, and they were overwhelmed with fear hmm. but jesus you know goes over and he this is a marvelous touch <laughs> yeah i he wanted to them. say i i you know i've read this story i've told it from mark 
but until I just heard you tell it now, I'd never noticed that in this version, I don't think it happens in Mark. Jesus no. touches them. Um, yeah. and, you know, you did that hand gesture. We can't see very many gestures. <laughs> There's my hand right. yeah. <laughs> on Zoom, but I didn't yeah. see your hand reach out. <laughs> right. Well, he, he was calming them down. You yeah. Know. Okay. Is that, is that what's going on? You think he's yeah. trying? To... Yeah. He's comforting them and and helping them deal with their fear. Yeah. And yeah. he's saying, you know, get up. You don't have to be afraid. It's interesting too because that also sort of supports. I mean, that he's real. He, he, he can touch them. He's not. He's not a ghost or something like. That. Right. An imaginary right. vision. They right. experienced him actually touching them. That's a right. little physicality going on there. Yeah. Yep. Body. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Let's see. The, oh well, the last thing is, you know, are there any implications for this in this story for uh, ministries of peace with and justice? You, uh, a clear implication is you don't mess with God in relation to the the observance of the law and of the practice of justice. Uh, there is, uh, in the presence of God, uh, there are real consequences for disobedience uh, and for uh, not following in the relation to the commandments and the practice of justice for the widows, for orphans, for people who are outsiders, for uh, all those who are in need of justice. God is for justice and peace. And so this is a story that is full of the dynamics of the divine presence as a presence of peace and of this being a story that is uh, that advocates, that recognizes the power of God for justice. Mm -hmm. And so the arc of justice may bend long, but it bends around uh, to completion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an imprecise quotation of Dr. <laughs> King. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but okay. that's the sentiment. Uh, of this story. Uh, Anything else you want to um, share about this story for the good of our viewers? <laughs> I think this is, I would suggest that everybody look up uh, the uh, story of Moses in the tent in Exodus 33. Uh, and just to, you know, read through that story so that you uh, have in the background of your mind, the story that Matthew is clearly alluding to and, and assuming that uh, his listeners would recognize and remember, uh, but we don't. Uh, and so it would be good to, uh, to read through that story, to read it out loud, to experience that uh, transformative moment in the history of Israel and of Israel's relationship with God. Okay, there you have it. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good week. And Thank enjoy you. this this grand story that kind of closes out the season of Epiphany, season after Epiphany. Right. Okay. A little bit of glory. A little, lot of glory. <laughs> a lot of dazzling glory, <laughs> which is often much needed. <laughs> it's there. It's there to be had in our faith. Bye, everyone. Bye.